Hello, all of you healthy humans, and thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Alter Your Health podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Alter. Thank you so very much for tuning in, taking the time out of your presumably busy day to be with me here and now, wherever you are. I acknowledge you, I appreciate you, and I'm so looking forward to sharing this episode with you. And if it's your first time tuning in, of course, subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. That is after you listen to the full episode, of course, because it's worth the listen. And if it is inspiring and uplifting for you, feel free to share it with someone in your world, a friend, a family member, a loved one who might be inspired by this sort of content and information. So thanks again for tuning in and I wanna dive into this, but first I wanna introduce our guest who is the weight loss champion, none other than Chuck Carroll. Chuck Carroll has lost, let's see, 420 pounds. No, he he hasn't lost 420 pounds, but he was 420 pounds. And in this conversation, he talks about how he is maintaining about 140 pounds, I believe that is. So um, so that would be 280 pounds that he has lost. I actually don't know exactly how much he lost right away. He talks about how it was pretty dramatic after his gastric bypass procedure. Um, but he's maintained his weight loss, which is really not so common after a gastric bypass procedure. We talk about that a little bit in this conversation. But in any case, he is the weight loss champion. And not only is Chuck Carroll the weight, the weight loss champion, he's also a professional radio personality, a podcast host. And I must say that I feel a little self-conscious in this interview connecting with someone of his stature, so to speak, in the in the field of podcasting. He's a great podcaster. And by listening to his podcast, which is The Exam Room, it's the Physician Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine podcast, I must say that I've learned a thing or two. Well, of course, I've learned a lot with regard to health and nutrition and reversing disease with a whole food plant-based diet. And I personally have learned a thing or two when it comes to podcasting and telling a good story and having a good conversation. So I'm trying my best here and uh, it is a journey and I'm on it. Uh, But this obviously isn't about me. This is about our guest, Chuck Carroll, and I want to give him a little bit of an introduction before we dive into the episode. So at just five foot, six inches tall, he weighed 420 pounds. If you can imagine, that's kind of a, you know, a shorter gentleman, a smaller frame, but he was holding a lot of weight. Like so many others, he tried and failed countless times to lose weight and any excess he achieved was short-lived as the weight came pouring back on and then some. So his weight loss journey, if you're looking at the screen, was up and down, kind of trending upward, I guess we could say. And uh, he culminated at 420 pounds at age 27. And out of desperation, he decided to undergo gastric bypass surgery. And we talk a little bit about that decision and he really says that it is kind of it was kind of a a last resort he thought that he wasn't going to live till he was 30 once again he was just 27 so this was like total desperation but then the unexpected happened after surgery he woke and never looked back and we talk about how after surgery he actually felt like he was hit by a truck which actually supported him in you know, adhering to the recommendations of portion control and staying on a liquid diet and then pureed food and, you know, that sort of thing. He walks us through kind of the protocol after gastric bypass. But as we talk about, so many people who undergo this sort of procedure regain their weight, but not the weight loss champion, not Chuck Carroll. So although a critical component, the surgery provided or proved only to be the first step in his journey. In fact, he only attributes about 10% of his weight loss success to the procedure. In just over a year, Chuck shed 64% of his entire body weight, 
by conquering food addiction, which we talk about a lot in this conversation, and devoting himself to a healthier lifestyle. And get this, you guys, he did this without ever setting foot inside a gym. We actually didn't even talk about that concept, but I always say that, you know, food is central. And a lot of people try to over-exercise or out-exercise a crummy diet, and it's just not possible, and it's just not sustainable or healthy. So that's pretty amazing. He lost all that weight without ever setting foot inside a gym, and he became a student of nutrition and health and is a living testimony that there is a difference between dieting and changing your diet. So true, so, so true. After watching the documentary, What the Health, as we talk about in this conversation, Chuck decided to go full on whole food plant-based vegan. He was in it to win it and that he did. We talk about that kind of cold tofu transition, as we like to say. And in October 2017, he launched, he launched the Exam Room podcast, like I said, which is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine podcast. And that show is weekly and it focuses on nutrition and has a heavy focus on weight loss and disease prevention and reversal through whole food, plant-based nutrition. <sighs> so this is a great conversation. Buckle your seatbelts and relax and enjoy this one with our guest, Chuck Carroll. All right, welcome back to the Alter Your Health podcast. I'm with our guest today, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so much, Chuck, for being open to being on the show and sharing your story. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to have me on, man. It's, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, and like I was just saying, I'm speaking with someone who speaks on the radio and on podcasts for a living, so I feel a little bit like, all right, I got to do this right. I got to make sure I know what I'm doing, and I, you know, I'm, I'm learning as I go, but like I was just saying, I'm taking a lot of notes from Chuck. He's a great guy, great podcaster, and we'll get into his podcast journey and how he got into the PCRM podcast. Um, but where should we start, Chuck? Should we start in childhood? I want to I wanna know about your weight story. I think it's just inspiring. I've, I've seen photos on Instagram and the transformational story is really just touching to me and I think has inspired so many. So let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. Okay. So we have about an hour. Let's see if I can put it all in. I mean, this, this really is kind of a long and, and winding road here. Um, I, you know, I, I wasn't born 420 pounds. It took 27 years to get up to uh, my maximum weight. And I think what's important to note it, being 420 pounds is, yeah, that's heavy, but also keep in mind that I'm only five, five on a good day. So, uh, I mean, I was packing quite a bit into a small frame. Uh, my, my waist at its largest was 66 inches and uh, I was squeezing into a size six XL shirt. Um, and the scary thing, the real scary thing was when I was really at my heaviest, I was about to become too big to shop even in a big and tall catalog. I think their waist size only goes up to 70 and I was putting on weight at such a rapid rate. I think within a year, I probably would have been out of options for clothes and wouldn't know what in the world to do. So that, that was, that actually a funny thing. And I don't talk too much about that, but that was actually a big motivating factor for me to, uh, to go ahead and make some changes and try to clean up my health just so I had some clothes to wear, man. How funny is that? Yeah. So that was at age 27. You peaked out. Is that correct? Yeah. Age 27, uh, was, was my max weight. So, um, and the other thing was I didn't think that I was going to live until the age of 30, even though I was already knocking on the door of it. You know, it was just a few years away, but my health was in such poor shape at that point. Like 30 just seemed like it was an impossible feat to reach. But, so in addition to the weight, what, what were your other health issues? Oh, man. 
I, you know, blood pressure was through the roof. I actually went on high blood pressure medication when I was still in high school. I think I was 15 um, when the doctor first put me on beta blockers. And I remember that conversation like it was yesterday. And I remember being just so upset and angry that the doctor had the audacity audacity to put me on high blood pressure medication when clearly that's only meant for old people. How dare she? But of course, when your blood pressure is 180 over 110, something has to be done to bring that under control. Um, so that was, that should have been the first wake up call, but no, you know, it was right back to the drive through even after that visit. Yeah. Wow. So at age 27, where in the world were you? What you, were you doing? Uh, what was your, your career path or your life path at that point? Oh man. Uh, where is anybody in their mid twenties? <laughs> um, so, uh, I had, uh, taken a little bit of a hiatus from radio. Uh, I kind of had media burnout and I was doing web development of all things. And, um, my weight was just coming on at, at such a clip, you know, I could not, walk across the street without my chest beginning to tighten and sweat would just start pouring down my face. Um, and it would just turn the bright shade of red about the shade of my shirt. Um, and it was really uncomfortable and, and quite scary. Um, so that, that was what I was doing web development and just trying to survive. Um, and like I said, man, I did not think that I was going to live to see, 30 years old. I was not happy with my career. I certainly was not happy with where I was in life on so many levels. Uh, and, and I just, I wasn't happy overall, you know, I, who can be happy when you can't live life the way that you want to live it. I was so mm -hmm. confined to that large frame that I was just waiting to break free. Uh, and it took a lot man, to break those chains, man. It really, really did. Yeah. So let's talk about what it took. Like what, what was the, the wake up call, the turning point? I know that you had gastric bypass and we're, we can talk about that mm -hmm. procedure a little bit and, and the, you know, what that entails and the recovery of that. But, but obviously it's not like, I, I assume you weren't dragged into the surgery center to get that procedure. It wasn't, you know, a, an elective kind of thing. So what inspired you to at least take that sort of action? So it was a combination of things. You know, there's no one straw uh, in this case that broke the proverbial camel's back. I got to find a better phrase than that. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely a combination of things. Um, the majority of them uh, were emotional. You know, I talked about the fear of not living to be 30 years old and the chest pains and the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, everything that goes with being that large. But really, man, it, it came down to the fact that here I was in my mid twenties and I was dating a girl at the time who, you know, I thought that I had hit the jackpot, man. I thought that she was gorgeous. She was so much thinner than I was. She didn't even have a weight problem, you know, like, so here I am, this enormous guy who somehow wound up being with this girl and you would look at the two of us and you would think, man, no way that they should be together. And she actually thought the same thing. She refused. I mean, put her foot down, said, you cannot tell your friends. You cannot tell your family. You cannot tell your coworkers that we are dating. And the only thing that I could think was that it was because she was ashamed of my size. But I thought also that this was the best that I could possibly do. And so that is what I settled for. I thought that, you know what? I'm not good enough for her. And so I just sucked it up. And it made me want to cry, but I, I kept pushing her on it and pushing and pushing and pushing until eventually she relented and she said, okay, when I come back from this trip, we can sit down, we can talk to my parents, we can talk to my friends and we'll, we'll tell them that we're dating. It's great. You know, cool. Cause here I am at that point, you know, I was still working in radio. I was one of those wacky morning sidekicks. I was getting some notoriety here in the DC area where I was based. And so, you know, I thought that I, I was 
you know, doing well career wise. And I had um, a lot of confidence in that regard, but with the relationship stuff, it was still a, a real big kick in the pants, but I thought, great, finally, it's all going to come together. Goes on this trip. And then when she comes back, man, you want to talk about frigid. She comes back in August and the relationship was like January. Um, it, it just became really cold, really distant, really quickly. And so within a couple of weeks of uh, her return, rather than actually sitting down and telling people, hey, we're dating, she decided to break it off. And that's, that was heartbreaking. And so uh, I turned to even more food uh, after that, put on some more pounds. And after I left uh, radio, I went and I took that web development job and I started putting on weight at a rate that I had never done before. And so when I got to um, this party with a bunch of colleagues who I hadn't seen in six months or so, they were all really alarmed with how much I had gained. And unbeknownst to me, um, they were super concerned to the point where they wanted to organize a little intervention for me. Uh, problem being there is that I got tipped off to it. And just like when I was at the doctor's office at 15 years old and they put me on beta blockers, uh, I got furious again. Like, who are they? Who are they to tell me that I have a problem? Of course I have a problem. I know that I have a problem. But shame on you for wanting to voice your concern to me. Like, this is my life. Who are you? Who are you? You're supposed to be my friend. You're supposed to support me. You're supposed to care about me. And right now you're trying to embarrass and anger me? No, screw you. And so I excommunicated them for, you know, a year or longer. And that really cut me to the emotional core. And that got me to thinking like, crap. I can't even begin to hide any of this anymore as if I ever could. And so I didn't know what else to do because I had dieted and tried so many different things. And I know you've heard this before, you know, I've tried every diet known to man and I really had, you know, I even went on something called the cookie diet, which please ask me about that in a little bit, because I think that this is just the craziest concept in the history of concepts. But, um, you, you kind of put all of that together and you just reach this breaking point. Emotionally, you want to be good enough in some girl's eyes to have an open relationship where everybody can know about it and celebrate. And you don't want to have friends who are so concerned with your health that they're organizing an intervention. And you just, you want to live to see tomorrow. But I didn't know what to do. So I had a friend who had uh, gastric bypass surgery and I reached out to her and she put me in touch with her surgeon and I went and I spoke with him and eventually wound up having the procedure. Now my father and stepmother had also had it uh, in the past, but we can talk about that as well. Anyway, I'm rambling long story short. That's how I got to gastric bypass. Got it. I want to know a little bit more about these diets, including the cookie diet, because I am <laughs> intrigued. But, um, you know, by the age of 27, your weight was like going, it sounds like up and down trending up to 420, which was the peak. Yeah. What, what were some of the things that you did try? And what was your experience with them in, ter in terms of weight loss along this weight gain ultimate journey? Well, you hit the nail on the head. You know, for every pound that you lose, you wind up putting two back on, it seems was the case. Um, there are so many of these program diets. Um, before the cookie diet, there was another one that uh, my mom had stumbled upon, and she was having success with it. And it was primarily a liquid diet, and it was nothing but shakes five times a day. Um, and you do that and you lose a significant amount of weight, but is that really sustainable long-term? No, is it like not. the Was it like the Jenny Craig shakes or I don't even know what they're It, it kind of was. I can't even remember the name of the program. It was through a gym um, and it was not one of the bigger named uh, programs out there. Um, but 
It was large enough that they had their Slim own. Slim Fast. Slim Fast was the one that I was trying yeah. to think of. So, so it, was, it was something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so I go on that and I lose weight. Um, and then it just gets, it gets tiring, you know? And y- you can't stay on that long term and you put the weight back on, man. Boom. And, and when you go off of these diets, it's not like the weight creeps back on. I mean, it just seems like a switch is flipped and overnight you put every single one of those pounds on and then the next night about double what you had lost comes back on as well. And that's the real scary part. Um, And then I had just tried, you know, traditional diet and exercise. And, you know, as soon as you stop exercising, then that weight's going to come pouring back on as well. And yeah. so with the cookie diet, now here's the genius of the cookie diet. All right. Let's hear this thing, it. Yeah. This thing, it, it makes me smile. Like it's not funny, but it's funny at the same time. The cookie diet is something that I was approached to do when I was still working at a radio station here in DC called Big 100.3. How appropriate, right? And, um, and they were like, we're looking for somebody to endorse this diet. Clearly, you have some weight to lose. We think that you would be the perfect person to do this. Cool. I'm going to get paid to lose weight, and I'm going to get to eat cookies? Are you kidding me? This is the greatest <laughs> day of my life. Yeah, win, win, win. Right. I couldn't lose, right? So uh, <laughs> so here's, here's the thing about the cookie diet, right? It is a, it is a vague prescription of you eat two of these cookies every day, and then have a sensible dinner. Now, what that sensible dinner was, they're never able to tell me. They basically just said, eat more fruits and vegetables, okay? Yeah. They didn't really know. What they did know was that you're supposed to eat these two cookies, which didn't taste anything like a cookie. It was like a brown <laughs> sponge, like a sponge that you would have near your sink to wash dishes. It was like one of those, and it just happened to have a couple of raisins and maybe a dash of cinnamon on it. And so you eat those and they taste like garbage, except for the raisin. And then you're supposed to drink a bunch of water with it and it expands in your stomach and that's supposed to keep you full for what, eight hours, six hours, whatever the case may have been until your next cookie or your next meal. No snacking involved in this. It's just the cookies and that sensible dinner. You think that would have lasted long term? Is that sustainable? (laughs) It's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's different than I thought it was going to be. I've heard things like the Twinkie diet where you, all you eat is Twinkies or something. And the idea being something like you get sick of Twinkies and then you just start calorically restricting to the point where you lose weight. But obviously that's, that's not a way to do it either. That sounds like the worst idea ever. The Twinkie <laughs> diet. I, I don't know if I can get on board with that one for so many reasons. I'd even raise an eyebrow when I was 420 pounds at that, the, but like, really, really? <laughs> I don't know if it's a real thing, but the, the idea of being like, you can theoretically lose weight eating anything. That's kind of the point, you know, if, but obviously we're going to get into what really is the sustainable approach to weight loss and, and eating, of course, but, but I want to go back to, um, so the ups and downs ultimately culminating at about 420 pounds, gastric bypass procedure. Um, Could you walk us through a little bit like what that procedure entails? I know it's otherwise called stomach stapling and I'm I'm familiar with it, but for listeners out there who've maybe heard gastric bypass, what happens and how does it potentially support people in losing weight? And also, I know that it doesn't always end up in sustainable weight loss a lot of people, I don't know what percentage, maybe you know, um, like the percentage of people that rebound and regain the weight despite having the gastric bypass procedure. So let's, let's talk about what gastric bypass is. Well, yeah, uh, gastric bypass essentially is uh, an internal rewire. So not only does it shrink the size of your stomach, that's the stapling part. You know, it takes your stomach and it shrinks it down to about the size of your thumb. Um, but the bypass part of that is they take your intestine and they reroute it. They, they essentially cut off a portion of your intestine and hook that up to your new stomach. And so you, you don't absorb all of the fat and the calories that you're eating in theory. 
so that's the bypass part. So I think my surgeon estimated uh, that maybe you absorb 70% initially of the fat and the calories that, that you're eating. Now, I don't know how accurate that is, and I suspect that over time that number increases as your stomach expands. Um, but the problem with that, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, is you, you're not just um, bypassing the area that absorbs fat and calories. You're also bypassing an area that is critical for absorption of a number of nutrients. Um, I will I will say right now that I'm not really thrilled with that area of it. Um, iron can be a little bit problematic for a lot of people, but at the same time, I'll tell you because this question always comes up. Uh, yes, I would have the surgery again. No, I would not hesitate to do it because of where I was in my life at that point. Um, that surgery flat out saved my life and it put me on this incredible journey that led me to your show today. Um, but the procedure itself, man, it's tough. So after you, you undergo that, you have this three to six month window where you physically cannot tolerate the type of foods that you had been eating that put you in that position to have the surgery in the first place. If you do, you're going to get sick like you've never, ever been sick before. You're going to turn green in the gills, man, and it's not going to be pretty. Did so, you experience that? Did bro, you? I, I was yeah. petrified. Of, of doing that. So I really stuck to the menu that they gave me um, afterward. I did not want to go through that kind of what they call dumping syndrome because mm. when they call it dumping syndrome for a reason because you're, yeah. it's either going to come out one way uh, or, or the other, top side or bottom side, man. It's, it's going to come back up uh, and you're going to be super dizzy too. Um, but no, uh, I did not. I was very cautious not to overeat, and I certainly was not putting stuff in my system that I shouldn't, because um, I, I just feared the consequences. I feared those consequences. Mm -hmm. So what, what was the diet that's more or less like prescribed or, or recommended after gastric bypass? It's a baby step thing. Uh, initially, you're on all liquids uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I mean, basically, water... Uh, you could have coffee, you can have, um, they encouraged you to drink a lot of Gatorade Zero or Powerade Zero. Um, and then they gave you little protein packets to kind of mix in there to make sure that you're getting the protein that you need. Protein is a huge thing in the bariatric community as if it isn't in every other community. Um, but that's, that was step one for the first few weeks. Then you go to uh, pureed foods. And that's when you start reintroducing things into your system. And that was, you're talking about things like uh, oatmeal would fall into the pureed category. Um, or you could take, you could even make like a meatloaf and throw that in the blender and puree that. Or eggs, you could scramble eggs and then puree them. Really, there wasn't that big of a restriction on what kind of food you could puree. They gave you a list of suggestions. Um, yogurt was also on there. Um, yeah, it seems like much more of a mechanical sort of thing rather than a biological or biochemical sort of thing. It was just like, what is going to mechanically ease and soothe and allow, you know, fit through the new digestive system rather than what is really this, this body needing nutritionally? Oh, absolutely. Because they load you up with supplements at the same time because you're not getting hardly any nutrition for the first month or so. That makes um, sense. So you're, I mean, you're popping vitamins like some people pop candy. It's, <laughs> it was ridiculous the amount of money you have to spend on vitamins after that procedure. Um, so you do that, and then you progress to soft foods, and that's where they encourage you to reintroduce things like meatloaf into your diet or tuna fish that's, you know, just got a ton of mayonnaise in it. So it goes down smooth, but not just regular mayonnaise. It's got to be Miracle Whip, right? So we don't want anything yeah. halfway natural in there for you. You um, want to like keep that, you know, tracked, lubricated with all the oily, gunky stuff, right? Yeah, that makes right. sense. Right. Ex exactly, <laughs> man. And be sure to eat that with white bread. So um, all, all of that, you know, kind of stuff. And then um, eventually you can get to like pulled chicken and pulled pork and um, have, uh, you know, a little piece of hamburger, that kind of stuff. Like the diet then became really not that much different than what most people eat before they go into the procedure. And I, I kind of thought that that was 
funny. Like I, I, I kind of cocked my head at that a little bit. I was like, hmm. But, you know, I went with it because I was seeing results and who was I to question. Um, the one thing, though, that I will tell you, and this is super important, I don't care what flipping diet you, you're doing, uh, put diet in quotes, if you have bariatric surgery or you're just trying to lose weight and change your life and clean up your health. The one thing that I did with this procedure that I think made the biggest difference was I made up my mind never again would I have a single bite of fast food or fried food. And so that immediately cut chips out of the equation. And for me, my big vice was Taco Bell. And I, I want you to ask me about food addiction in a little bit, because that's something that so many of us struggle. I mean, millions of people struggle with food addiction. But you have to make up your mind to do that because otherwise, if you start to reintroduce that stuff into your system, even just a little bit, it opens the door for you to introduce it a lot. And then you're going to be right back to where you were. And so I remember it was the morning after I was released from the hospital. My father and stepmother had come down from New York to where I was in the DC area. And they were going to help me recover a little bit because both of them, it had also had gastric bypass previously, uh, varied levels of success. Initially, very wonderful results. Uh, unfortunately, my father has put the majority of the weight back on. Um, but they brought me a cup of black coffee from McDonald's. And it wasn't the coffee that upset me. It was the fact that here I was, just removed from this procedure, having spent my entire life patronizing those types of establishments, gorging on that type of food. That was what put me in that position in the first place. Why in the Sam heck would they then bring me something from there? I saw those golden arches and I got pissed, man. Like I wanted to take that cup of coffee and just throw it across the room and be like, get that crap out of my face. But I didn't say that to them. I just kind of kept that to myself. But I never even took a sip of that coffee. And so that was really what set in stone my, my will, my desire never to return to 420 pounds. And so I think that you have to be hardcore in those decisions and know that for a lot of people, you can't have just one thing. You can't go there just once and expect to be okay. Because then, man, it's just like an ex-smoker, man. You think you can have one cigarette, but before you know it, you got another pack in your hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that fast food restaurants are good for one thing, and that's going to the bathroom on a long road trip. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. And I mean, even, yeah, even I can appreciate even that sentiment of the coffee and just how that represented this whole world of this past life that you were trying to step free from. Mm -hmm. And, and I do want to get into the, the food addiction and emotional eating component, because I would imagine that that was a huge part of your life. And then you go and have this procedure. And then it sounds like you just really just drew the line in the sand. No more. You just, you know, created those, those simple rules, the fast food and the fried food. And it sounds like that was an effective statement within yourself of kind of moving forward in a generally healthier direction. But I'm still kind of curious how that was able to stick at that point in time. I trust that you, before your procedure, I trust that there were moments where it's like, oh man, I'm not doing that again, but I'm sure it would happen again. Um, like a lot of, you know, addicts kind of going in that circle, winding down. Um, so, so what really enabled that declaration within yourself to stick in terms of honoring yourself and your body and your health from that point forward? You, you know, man, like I honestly don't even know. I was not expecting that at all. It was something that just happened when I woke up from the procedure. And maybe it was just because I felt like I had been hit by a truck because mine was not done laparoscopically. He said it was going to be a mini lap, 
Like, oh, okay, what does that mean? Well, he still wound up cutting right through my abdomen to go in there and, and do his thing. So, I mean, I woke up feeling worse than I ever had in my entire life. And that probably was like, screw this, man. I am never doing this again in a million zillion years. So that probably was, was the motivating factor then. But then, you know, thinking back to also all of the failed diets, quote unquote, that I had been on before then. I think back to the times when I thought that I had it under control. I think back to the times when I, I, I didn't think I had it under control. I knew that I had it under control. And I can trace it back this one particular diet to my, my one slip up. And I remember exactly where I was and I remember exactly what I ate. I just lost 70 pounds, was feeling great, looking a lot better. And I was like, man, cool, I got this. And I had one nacho, just one nacho. I thought, man, I got this. I can have one nacho. I dipped it in that nacho cheese and I ate it. Oh man, it was so good. I was like, I can have another nacho. And I dipped it again and I ate that. And then before you know it, man, I'm crushing nachos and I'm back at Taco Bell. And that was it, man. I'd fallen off the wagon. And so I call that my one nacho theory. Because I know that you can't have just one nacho, man. You have that one nacho and it's all over. And that goes to the heart of food addiction. So I remember that and I remember how crappy I felt immediately after the surgery. And that is where that, that dedication really comes from. Yeah, I think that, you know, we know to some degree that a lot of these fast food companies and, and big food uh, corporations design the food to be addictive addictive. And I also know that if I were to go and have one nacho at this point of time in my life, I probably would put it in my mouth and kind of like, Ugh, and spit yeah. it out. Yeah. So it's like, we're not, the one nacho thing is it's, um, it's totally true for someone who is, um, you know, vulnerable and susceptible to getting wo you know, wrapped up in it. But at the same time, on, on the other side of things, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would kind of be repulsed at a bite of a cheeseburger and, or a nacho or another kind of food that could be addictive. And maybe it's because of that, you know, for lack of a better term, addictive tendency that some people have at various points in their, in their lives. So could you share a little bit about you know, maybe like, you know, have... In, in your life, have you had other addictive tendencies that kind of, um, you know, that kind of compulsive uh, thinking and behavioral kind of, kind of like presented itself in the world besides food or was it, has it kind of just been food for you? Uh, food was uh, always the biggest one. There were some other things, um, you know, the, I was, I was quite fond of marijuana in my younger days. Um, and it wasn't like I could just do that occasionally with friends. It was like, I was high all day, every day. And, um, that was a, that was a real problem. That was actually scary for me. Uh, cause I was like, damn, man, I, I can't even go a day without getting high five and six times. Like I was a full blown functional pothead. Um, and you know, I was going to work high. I was coming home high. I was like taking lunch breaks and getting high then. And it was just like, wh who am I, man? Like this, this isn't me. Um, so yeah, th there was always that component. Um, luckily it, it never transitioned into to anything else. Um, so food was really it for me, but let me, let me tell you about food addiction. This is, I don't think that a lot of people realize what it's like when you see somebody who is 400, 500, 600 pounds, right? The first thing you need to know is that nobody chooses to be that healthy or that overweight. Nobody does. It's not by choice. It's their brain reacting to food, man. They have an addiction, just like a drug addict has an addiction to whatever their drug is, just like an alcoholic has an addiction to the bottle. That's food addiction right there, man. And so breaking that addiction is the hardest thing that a lot of us will ever do in our entire life. Every time I would try to diet, I would detox off of Taco Bell. Try to. That was my big vice, man. I would go to Taco Bell every single day. I even worked at another Mexican restaurant for a couple of years 
during that stretch. Mm. And I would still leave there and go to Taco Bell. You know, that's how, that's how addicted I was to their food. And they knew my car and they knew my order because it was the same thing every single day. And so by the time I even got to the menu board, man, they would see me come and they'd like, Hey, Chuck, how's it going? Here's your order today. You totals such and such, whatever it was about 20 bucks, pull through and they had it ready for me, man. And it was a hefty stack of food, but food addiction, man, when you try to break that the first night, you know, it sucks, but I guess you still have enough of that roaming around in your system to kind of tide you over night two, you start to feel sick, uh, not good emotionally, not good physically night three, you're starting to feel really sick and really angry and depressed and frustrated. I remember being curled up on my bed, almost in a ball. You know, my, my skin had just turned this, this grayish pale color and I was sweating a little bit and, and my skin hurt to touch like, um, like when you get the flu or something like that. And I was sitting in bed, man. And, and I remember just being so angry because all I could think about was going to Taco Bell and eating my $20 worth of, of grilled stuffed burritos and nachos bell grande and burrito supremes and all of those delicious things that, that my body just craved. But I wasn't giving in at that point. So I was so frustrated, man. I got out of bed and I put my fist through a wall. But that wasn't enough. So then I put my fist through a door. I got straight up violent, not to the point where I'm attacking other people, but the house certainly took a pounding. And so matter of fact, this particular time I'm talking about was when I was on the cookie diet. And so I knew that I had this endorsement deal and I knew that I couldn't let anybody down because I was being paid to endorse this cookie diet. So I waited until the middle of the night Everybody else was asleep. I snuck out the back door, got in my car, drove to the 24-hour Taco Bell, got 20 bucks worth of food, came home, binged, ate every single bite of it, and then hid the evidence and then just made sure to work out for an extra hour, hour and a half at the gym so I could theoretically burn those calories off and continue to lose weight. And I would do that every single night. That was my routine. People didn't know why I wasn't angry on that fourth and fifth and sixth day. They just knew that I was more pleasant to be around. It wasn't until recently that I even admitted the fact that I was still going to Taco Bell that entire time. But that is food addiction, man. When you go through a detox like that, when you psychologically cannot think about anything else, when you're at a point when you feel physically ill because you're not getting your fix, that's an addiction, man. Mm -hmm. For real. So I'm curious today, as we're you know, talking today, do you consider yourself a recovering addict or do you feel like you are kind of totally like, because I know a lot of people kind of relate to other, other substances like, oh, I'm in recovery. And I don't really understand that. And I'm not, I don't really want to talk, talk about that per se, but I'm, I'm just curious your relationship with, with food addiction at this point. Do you feel like you're totally clear, secure, at peace and uh, strong in yourself in your food choices today, or is it still like an ongoing journey? I don't want to use the word battle, but I know a lot of people s speak that way. Just curious what it is like now for you. Uh, I, I am definitely still recovering and I will be until yeah. the day that I leave this earth. Um, because I just, as much as the idea of going back to a drive through repulses me, I am petrified of the idea of what would happen if I did go to that drive through My brain hasn't changed. My insights may have changed. My will, my desire, my focus in life now is much, much, much different. But that addiction always lingers, man. So think about it like this, right? It, does an alcoholic really ever get over it? There are alcoholics that have gone decades between drinks. But when they have that first drink again over time, thinking, I got this licked, I'm not recovering anymore, I'm not an alcoholic, boom, man, you, you take that sip and you open Pandora's box. So food for me is the same thing. And it scares the crap out of me, to be honest with you. That type of food scares the crap out of me. So yes, I am always going to be in recovery. And that stuff will always drive me to continue to uh, just stay the path that I am now.
I, I cannot risk going back to where I was, nor would I want to. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. I have one of the, my favorite quotes around addiction that I've heard. I don't know if it is a quote and who said it, but you know, the, the idea that alcohol or drugs or food is not the problem, but it's the answer. It's the solution to um, an emotional or a spiritual kind of longing or desperation or lack. And um, I, f- I personally feel like once we can identify that and just kind of find the, you know, the, the real solution to kind of heal and mend and sustainably cure the, the inner problem, then the, the outer, the other solution, the substances and the, the food or the sex or the gambling, whatever it is, that is no longer um, desirable or doesn't really even make sense in the, in the new context of someone's new kind of life with a greater sense of wholeness and wellness within. I agree with that. Um, yeah. the, the one caveat being though, food is a little bit different than drug, sex, or alcohol. All right. Food is something right. that we eat from day one. Babies don't we come out to do it. Right, man. Yeah. Babies still come out of the womb, you know, w- reaching for that kind of a bottle. Um, so, you it's know, true. It, we, we developed this, this addiction at a very early age. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized that, man, my, my struggles really began even before elementary school. It, it began in my grandma's kitchen when we would go over there and she would be fixing us hamburgers and french fries or frozen pizza uh, or even after leaving there and having just gorged on macaroni and cheese then going to uh, Burger King and and getting a double whopper with ketchup only and another big thing of fries and a soda and so that relationship with food begins long before there's even any emotional trauma and so it, it kind of plants the seed And then, of course, over time, as we get older and that trauma does occur because bad stuff happens to us all, right? We turn to food for comfort, and that's really when things kind of take a turn for the worse. But that's kind of what makes food unique is that those seeds have been planted long before the stuff hits the fan. Yeah, it's it's so true. And it is it is unique that food is something that we clearly can't live without. Uh, So it's like that that relationship with food It's not like we can just cut it off. We, ha- we always have to have a relationship with food. So now I want to kind of maybe like shift gears a little bit and talk about the relationship with food now and uh, specifically veganism and whole food plant-based nutrition, which I know is kind of a central part of your life, or at least it is with regard to your role in the exam room podcast, the PCRM Physicians Com- Committee of Responsible Med- Medicine podcast. Um, so when did the, the vegan light bulb go off in the brain was, and at what point in that, what after, like after the, the gastric bypass, you talked about kind of going in like tuna fish sandwiches and meatloaf <laughs> in the blender and these kind of things. Crazy. So, right? when, <laughs> so when did the, uh, yeah. When did the veganism kind of thing get fired up within? Man, you know, it, it wasn't until years uh, after I had the procedure. It was like six, six years or so uh, after the procedure. I was um, interviewing um, somebody for a, a sports column that I write. And they are a, a pretty well-known professional wrestler who's plant-based. And they were telling me about this documentary that they had just watched called What the Health. And they were like, man, you have to go and watch this right now. I was like, cool, man. All right, so here's this wrestler. I like wrestling. Now he's talking about health. The, you know, this is, this is can't miss. Like, this has to be something cool. Was I expecting it to be a life-changing moment? No. So I watched the documentary. I'm like, man, that's legit. And I remember thinking about how they were talking about um, the caloric density of plant-based foods and how much you know, lower is than your, your higher calorie fast food fare. And I'm like, so petrified of putting the weight back on. And I start to think, I was like, if I eat this way, I get all these health benefits and I really don't have to worry about the weight coming back. Like this is, this is, this is legit, man. Let me, let me give this a try. And so I did. And I never looked back. And that's really kind of what put me on this journey. And everything that came along after that 
is just really icing on the cake because now I can share my enthusiasm with so many other people through the exam room and my work with the physicians committee, you know, and, and doing podcasts uh, such as yours. Like it's, it's really an honor. So had it not been for that one interview that that one five minute interview, man, just kind of changed the course of my life and I could not be happier about it. Wow. So that was just a couple of years ago or so because almost four years now. Yeah. Wow. What the health is, was four is four years old now. It seems like it was kind of like just yesterday because that was, that was definitely a, a light bulb documentary. I, you know, I know it got a lot of criticism, but what I really loved about it was it just brought so much light and perspective to the greater context of the healthcare industry mm -hmm. and just kind of showing all these lines of uh, interwoven kind of uh, political dark sides. So um, cool. So that was about four years ago where you light bulb went off and it was like no turning back, it sounds like. And I am curious about the weight loss from the gastric bypass procedure. Um, what was, what, what is that weight loss journey been like? Was it like all the immediately within the first couple of years and just boom, 420 pound Chuck is now, I don't know how much you weigh now, but you know, it's just voila, like overnight or what has it been like and how has the, the plant-based whole food nutrition supported you in kind of getting to your optimal weight or allowing you to maintain your optimal weight? Oh, maintain the optimal weight is just, I mean, I cannot say enough about that and, and all the, the cool stuff that comes along with that, like lower cholesterol, don't ever have to worry about high blood pressure, all of that cool stuff. So the plant-based diet is what's up for keeping it off long-term. But the initial loss after the procedure, man, I mean, it wasn't like a, a, a slow and steady uh, decline, man. It was like... Vroom, you know, and then it kind of plateaus over time. So it really only took about 18 months to lose uh, 265 pounds. Um, so I got all the way from 420 down to 155. Um, and that's where I stayed really for about, oh gosh, those six years, man. So after I lost it, so it would have been about four and a half years that, that I maintained that weight, you know, with a little bump here and, and then lose it again uh, there. Um, but once I went on that plant-based diet, like I didn't realize how much fluff I was still carrying around. Remember, I'm only 5'5". Five five, so if you look at the BMI scale, like it was still telling me that I was obese, not just overweight, but obese at 155, which I kind of thought was really funny, but whatever. Um, and I look back at some pictures and I'm like, yeah, I got a bit of a pot belly there. And so the plant-based diet, though, that sucked another uh, 15 as much as 20 pounds off of me. Um, and so now I'm right around 140 and I feel absolutely fantastic. Um, I just cannot say enough about the way that it's, it's helped me keep that weight off long term and make me feel way younger than I actually am. Like, I feel like I lost my 20s to being uh, obese and now I kind of feel like here I am at 37. I've got my 20s back, man. So I I'm really excited about where things are. That's awesome. And I'm curious about, you know, your relationship with food back to that a little bit. Do you count calories or kind of portions control or, cause I know one thing that's really fantastic about a whole food plant-based diet that's, you know, no added salt, oil, sugar, these kind of things. It's kind of like an eat all you want diet. Eat, eat when you're hungry, stop eating when you're full and people don't have to worry about gaining weight. Is that your current relationship with food or you're still kind of portioning things out for yourself? I do, in all honesty, just because I'm so petrified, and, and this is me personally, um, I do kind of also watch my portions, but I don't count calories. Like, um, And I'm very careful about not overeating. I don't want to eat point the past of being full. Um, so that's that's just me. But yeah. for the majority of people on that whole food plant-based diet, bro, it is an all day buffet. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a, and, and it's so great. I love doing shows where I get to talk about that and showing this chart that shows what 500 calories looks like in the stomach. And it has oils, and then it has dairy, and then it has meats, and then whole grains, and then eventually fruits and vegetables. And it's so funny. You know, here's that, that whole huge stomach, which is the itty bitty bit of oil there that represents 500 calories. And then you go to the other end of the, 
the spectrum and you have this whole huge stomach, which is then overflowing with fruits and vegetables at 500 calories. Like yeah. that's the cool thing about this diet. That's the all day buffet right there, man. Like mm. it's really, if you truly eat that way, you will never, ever, ever have to count calories or worry about your portions. The only yeah. thing that you have to consider, man, is like, if you're full, put the fork down. Other than that, you're good to go. Yeah, totally. And I think it's really great that you're honoring your body and not, you know, and controlling your portions and not overeating because I think in any, you know, regardless of what you're eating, overeating is possible. You know, even if you're eating cucumbers and, you know, carrot sticks, you're still liable to like eat too much to the point where you feel uncomfortable and just mm -hmm. are kind of disrespecting your body in that regard. So I think it's great that you kind of have have that continual awareness of uh, what's how you feel inside because I forget the the Japanese saying, but I'm sure you've been familiar with that. You know, eat until you're only like partially full because the the brain stomach signal it takes a few minutes for that to catch up and signal to yourself that hey, I actually am full, even though I I'd only felt seventy percent full. Now I actually am full. So yep. it's something that I'm kind of experimenting and exploring with all the time because I'm pretty active and I feel like I've got to eat a lot, but I feel like I'm generally eat more than I probably like quote unquote need. But <laughs> I think, but I, it, but that being said, it's like maintaining weight, maintaining fitness, maintaining health. Most importantly is effortless. It's like, you don't have to worry about things. Not, not really, but you want to know what the, the, the funny thing is. I think back to the question is like, are you afraid of putting weight back on? And I, I still find myself from time to time getting angry when I'm full because I don't want to put that fork down because I enjoy food still so much to this day that like, I don't ever want it to end, you know? And so that's, you know, again, that's, that's me and that's going to be other food addicts, but you know, the majority of people probably won't experience that but that's that food addiction man it still rears its ugly head every now and again so you got to be careful with it just no matter what it is that you're eating but again this this plant-based diet i know that even if i were to overeat that at least i'm fueling my body with stuff that is lower in calories super nutrient dense and it's never no matter what going to put me back into the position that I once was. Hmm. All right. So four years ago, you watched this documentary and kind of light bulbs went off, went down the plant-based uh, path head on, it sounds like. And now you're working for the physicians committee of responsible medicine, like we had talked about and you're hosting their podcast called The Exam Room. How did that happen in the span of the, you know, I know that the podcast is relatively new, I think a couple of years old or something, but um, how did that happen for you? Do you want to share that story briefly? Sure. Uh, I became aware of the Physicians Committee, uh, uh, gosh, seven years ago, something like that. I was hosting a uh, radio show with an NFL player, and we were approached about doing a PSA for them. Um, before I was even plant-based, they were looking for professional athletes and other personalities to be featured in this campaign that they called Teaming Up for Health. And so they put us on there, and that's when they first kind of popped on my radar. And I always kind of tucked that in the back of my head. I was like, okay, well, that's cool. And then I was working as um, – a news anchor for NBC News Radio, and I was getting burned out with that, you know, just telling bad news day in and day out. Like, I knew that there was something more to, to media than just spreading, you know, news about chaos and destruction. Like, I wanted to do something positive with my life. And so, for a while, I had this idea rattling around in my brain about doing this podcast. Um, with with the physicians committee and, and talking about health studies and, and telling stories about people who have, you know, really conquered their health problems through plant based diets. And so I just approached them one day. And I was like, Hey, do you guys have a show? Do, do you want to do a podcast? And they were really receptive to the idea. And so, you know, I think we had just three meetings. And then we were off and running after that. It, it happened really, really quickly. Um, and man, am I ever so grateful that it did. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. So, so you were familiar with the physicians committee committee before you went vegan, but, um, how long ago was the, that interaction where you kind of set it up? That was after uh, you were vegan, it sounds like. Or, yeah. So yeah, I was, I had been plant-based for probably a year, year and a half. Um, maybe even close to two years, tag on, uh, before I approached them. Matter of fact, it was two years because it will be, uh, it was right around this time two years ago that I, that I approached the physician's committee about doing the show. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, man. So, uh, yeah. So it, obviously listeners out there can tune into really great episodes, really great informative content. And, uh, you're, you are, you know, a kind of a radio personality. We can feel you and, you know, kind of resonate with you. Your voice is good to connect with your face here, but you do have such a, a relatable and kind of warming voice, which I think is obviously, that's why you're doing what you're doing. Well, thank you, man. As do you, yeah. you know, you could be doing commercials. You could be doing voiceover work. Get that side I'll, hustle going, man. All right. I'll think about it. I'll stay, <laughs> stay focused on the, the health for now, but it, but having you know this kind of relationship with getting information out there concerning health, I think is is important, increasingly so in this sea of misinformation, might we say, where you know people are caught up in trends and fads and these diets, which you know we have been c- kind of using the term diet, but for for listeners out there, I think it's important to know that a diet really just means a way of eating. It doesn't mean Atkins. <laughs> God, please don't let it mean Atkins, please. No Atkins, no keto, none of that stuff. None of that stuff. Um, But maybe we could wrap up with just some kind of tangible, practical tips for people who are moving in the direction of, uh, you know, releasing patterns around emotional eating and addiction or weight loss or health in general. It seems like you've, you've presented some really great tangible kind of ideas of just kind of drawing the line in the sand and moving forward. But I'm curious if, if anything else has been supportive for you and your journey and continues to be, you know, I trust that listening to content like this is, is one thing that people can do to kind of just stay in a good energy field with regard to this sort of information that's positive and uplifting. But what else does Chuck like to recommend? (laughs) Well, if you're just getting going, um, you know, there are two things that are critically, critically important. And those are openness and acceptance. One, you have to be open to the idea of change. The idea of a plant-based diet is so radical to the majority of us because it's so counter to what we've been taught our entire lives. You know, think back to the food pyramid that we're taught in school. Think back to how milk is this thing that will help us live longer and give us these big, strong bones and could never do uh, any harm to us. Matter of fact, it does the body good and you have to eat meat to get your protein. And that's what we're taught from such a young age. So you have to open your mind and realize that maybe that's not so. You have to put that correlation together like, well, here we are as a society and the obesity rates keep going up and up and up and up. And this is what we're eating. Like, so what's going on there? Open up your mind. Two, acceptance. Accept the fact that change is not always easy. You are going to be fighting something that you have fought your entire life in terms of food addiction. All right. This is something that you will go through hell. I'll just come out and say it. You will go through hell for a couple of days, maybe even a couple of weeks before you can kind of break through and break that addiction and get yourself really going on the other side. There are going to be days where it's easier and there are going to be days when you're going to want to put your fist through a wall and put your fist through a door and do whatever it is that you, you, you need to do to release that anger and to feel better. But you can not give in. Just let that stuff out, but don't ever put that stuff back in your body because when you do, you hit that reset button and you got to start all over again. And it's not always the funnest process in the world. So accept that it's going to suck for a little bit, but then you also have to accept that you have that power to get through it. All right. I'm not Superman. Anybody else who's ever lost a significant amount of weight is not Superman or Superwoman. Nobody's a superhero. Everybody has that power in them to change. Every single person. If you're hearing this and you have a lot of weight to lose, guess what? 
you can lose it. You have to eliminate the words, I can't, from your vocabulary. I know that that's trite and that's cliche to say, but it's so true. You absolutely can do it and you will do it because you want to do it. And when you break through to that other side, man, it is the sweetest feeling in the entire world. So have an open mind, accept the fact that it may not be the the easiest thing in the world, but then recognize also that you have that power within you to change. You have that power within you to change. There are a few little tweaks here and there that you can add to it. But at the base, those are the big things, my friend. Boom. Powerful. It's been really a pleasure to connect and have this conversation, hear your story, get to know you a little bit better. And for those of uh, the listeners that are out there and curious to follow your journey, know what you're up to, could you direct us to uh, where to find you, like on social media, or do you have a website and obviously the, the podcast information as well? Yeah, man, of course. Uh, Social media for Instagram and Twitter, it is the same. It's at Chuck Carroll, WLC. That's Carroll with two R's and two L's. The WLC stands for Weight Loss Champion. Uh, And then uh, the website, you can also check me out at theweightlosschampion.com. And of course, the Exam Room Podcast, as long as I'm throwing out plugs, uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever podcasts are served up, wherever you find this podcast, you can also find the Exam Room by the Physicians Committee. And we would appreciate it so much if you would subscribe. Yes, subscribe, subscribe, (laughs) and tune in. They really are, you know, informative and inspiring episodes, all sorts of great knowledgeable guests like Dr. Barnard and others. Uh, So thanks for doing what you're doing, Chuck. Thanks for being here, being you. And, uh, you know, it's clear to me in hearing your story that as we all know from a higher perspective, this was all, this journey is really for you and for the greater community like you would not be doing what you're doing today if you didn't peak out at 420 at age 27 and now having that history having that story being able to share it is really changing the world so thank you and um yeah thank you my friend and thank you for what it is that you do as well all right well peace and love and until next time